Welcome back. So one of the important applications of calculus is being able to determine the minimum and maximum values of a function. And we've seen that. We have seen how to look at a function and find its relative minimums and its relative maximums by finding the derivative of our function and setting it equal to zero, right? Because at these points where we have relative maximums or relative minimums, the slope of our function is equal to zero. And since the first derivative is equal to that slope, if we set it equal to zero and solve for values of x, that is how we found where our maximum and minimum values would be. And so we can actually take this concept and apply it to more real world settings. Think of terms like the greatest volume or the smallest area. Those are examples of where we'd want to optimize something by either finding a maximum or minimum value. And so let's look at a simple example of an optimization problem where we can use this method of finding either a maximum or minimum value. And so here we have our first example. We want to find two positive numbers whose sum is 50 and the product is a maximum. And so the way we're going to go about this is try to think of equations that are going to represent this scenario. So we're told that we have two positive numbers whose sum is 50. All right, well, let's create two numbers. Let's say x and y, and if we add them together, they're gonna be equal to 50. And then we're told that we wanna find the value of these two numbers, given that their sum is 50 and their product is a maximum. And so that means we are looking to maximize the product P of X times Y, right? If we defined our two numbers to be X and Y, then this would be the equation to represent their product. And so now we have these two equations that we got from our problem here. And so now what would be our next step? Well, we know we want to find these two numbers that's going to maximize this product, right? We want this product to be the largest number that it can possibly be, given that these two numbers sum is 50. And so since this equation is related to the quantity that we want to maximize, we're going to take the derivative of it. But notice that this function is defined in terms of two variables. And so what we want to do is get this equation in terms of one variable, right? We have x and y. Let's try to get it in just x or just y. And so in order to do that, we're going to get help from this equation. This is what we call our constraint or our secondary equation, but let's just call it the constraint for now. And that's because this includes a fixed value, which is this 50 right here, right? These two numbers must have the sum of 50. That's not going to change, unlike the product, which we do not know. We're trying to maximize that product. So because that 50 is fixed, this is our constraint. And this is what we're going to use to help get this equation in terms of one variable. So if we solve for one of these two variables, and then plug them into this equation, we'll then have an equation over here in terms of one variable. And so let's do that. I'm gonna solve for y in this case. So if I subtract x from both sides, we'll have that y is equal to 50 minus x. And so now we can substitute what y is equal to here in our other equation. So now we're going to have that the product is equal to x times 50 minus x. And so now we can distribute that x to each part of this quantity, and we'll have that the product is equal to 50x minus x squared. All right, so now before we move on and we take the derivative of our function here, we want to ask ourselves what values of x are going to make sense in this scenario, right? What is the smallest value of x or the largest value of x that is possible here? And so we call this the domain. What is the domain of our situation here? And so if we're thinking about what possible values of x we could have, well, we know it needs to be a positive value. Our problem states that we're looking for two positive numbers. And so the smallest value of x that we could pick here would be zero. If we pick zero, then y would be 50, and that would be equal to 50. But obviously zero times 50 is zero, so that would give you a pretty small product. I'm sure we could find a bigger one, but we do know that for our domain here, our smallest value of x is going to be zero. But what would be the largest value of x that we could pick? Well, we can't pick any number larger than 50 because if you picked, let's say 51, then y would have to be a negative number. y would have to be negative one to make our sum 50. And so the largest value that x can be would be 50. And so in this case, our domain will be from zero to 50. All right, and so this is going to be very helpful in case we came across several answers when we solved for x and we want to determine which answers make sense and which answers don't make sense. But let's just take the derivative of our function here and see what values of x we will find. And so if we'll do that, we'll have p prime is equal to the derivative of 50x, which is just going to be 50, and then a derivative of negative x squared will be negative 2x. And so then we want to set this derivative equal to zero, so we'll have zero is equal to 50 minus 2x, and we want to solve for x in this case. So we'll add 2x to both sides, so we'll have 2x is equal to 50, 
and then we'll divide both sides by two to find that x is gonna be equal to 25. And so what we found here is one of our two numbers whose sum is 50. We found x equals 25. And so what we can do now is take this value of x we found and plug it back into our constraint to find what y is equal to. And so if we do that, we'll have y is equal to 50 minus 25. And so y is equal to 25. And so we found our value of y and we found our value of x. And so in this case, our two positive numbers whose sum is 50 and the product is a maximum are going to be 25 and 25. And if you multiply 25 by 25, you would get 625. And so this would be your maximum product for this scenario. And if you don't believe me, if you're not sure, let me show you this chart that has the product of positive values that add up to 50 around the value of 25 that we found. And you can see that as you begin to pick different pairs of X and Y that aren't 25, your product begins to decrease, it gets smaller. So we can be sure that 625 is our maximum product in this scenario. And feel free to pause the video if you wanna look at this chart a little longer. But now let's look at another example problem. So for our next example, we have a farmer plans to fence a rectangular pasture next to a river such that it has three sides. The pasture must have 180,000 square meters. What dimensions will require the least amount of fencing given that none is needed along the water? And then you'll see we have a little picture here to represent our scenario. And so the first thing that we wanna do is label the edges of our pasture. And we know that this is a rectangular pasture. So we know that these two opposite sides here are going to be equal. And so I'll label those both with Y. And then I'll label our longer edge here with X. And so now if we wanna form equations to represent this scenario, we gotta look at what is in our problem here. We know that the pasture must have 180,000 square meters. And so this is a value of area. And so then we know that we want to at least have the area of 180,000 square meters for this pasture. And so what would be the area of this rectangular figure right here? Well, the area would just be equal to X times Y. And so in this case, our first equation would be 180,000 is equal to X times Y. This is going to be our constraint because it involves a fixed number, right? This 180,000 square meters is set in place. We have to have that 180,000 square meters. On the other hand, we wanna know the dimensions that will require the least amount of fencing. And so that is referring to the perimeter, right? If you look around the outside of a rectangle, this is where the fencing would be. And so the fencing doesn't go inside the rectangle, it's just on the outside. And so that means that we are talking about perimeter or the measurement of the outside of our rectangle. But in this case, our rectangle or our pasture only has three sides where we wanna have fencing. It has a fourth side over here, but the river is over there and we're told that none is needed along the water. And so we really only have three sides to worry about in terms of fencing. And so in this case, the perimeter P will be equal to two lengths of Y, right? So we're gonna have two Y plus X, the length of X. And so this is going to represent the amount of fencing that we need to close in this area. And so now we have our primary equation and we have our secondary equation, or if you wanna call it our constraint. And so now we wanna get this equation in terms of one variable so that we can take the derivative of it, right? Since we want to minimize our amount of fencing or minimize the perimeter, this is the function we wanna take the derivative of, not this one. And so we're going to use this equation with our fixed value to solve for one of our variables to then plug into this one so that it is only defined with one variable. And so in this case, I'm gonna solve for X again. So I'm gonna divide Y over to the other side. And so we'll have that X is equal to 180,000 divided by Y. And so then if we plug this into our perimeter formula, we'll have that P is equal to 2Y plus 180,000 thousand divided by y. And so now we have a formula that represents the perimeter of our pasture in terms of one variable. Now before we take the derivative of this function, we want to ask ourselves what values of y are going to make sense in this case. And so let's think about it. What would be the smallest value of y that you could have in this scenario? Well if you think about it, we're not going to have any negative values of y, right? You can't have a side that is measured in negative meters, so we can completely discard all of our negative values here. So for our domain, our lower bound will be zero. And then let's think about what our largest value of Y could be. 
Well, if you think about it, y is going to get larger as x gets smaller, because these two numbers multiplied together need to give us at least this 180,000 square meters. So as x would become a smaller and smaller value, up until zero, but you really wouldn't want x to be zero because then you wouldn't have any area, but x could get infinitely small towards zero, right? It could be a hundredth of a meter. You're not gonna be able to fit any animals in that pasture, but you could certainly still build that fence, right? And so y would get infinitely larger as x gets infinitely smaller to make sure that we still have that 180,000 square meters. And so in this case, our domain is just going to be from zero to infinity. Y can be any positive value. And so before we take the derivative, which is our next step, I'm just gonna rewrite our equation here to look like this. We're gonna have p is equal to two y plus 180,000 times y to the negative first power. And that's just gonna make it a little easier for us to see how to use our power rule when we take our derivative. And so then if we take our derivative, we'll have p prime is equal to the derivative of two y, and a derivative of two y is just going to be two, and then a derivative of this term will be negative one times 180,000. So I'll have plus 180,000 times negative one times y to the negative second power if we subtract one from our exponent there. And so then that means that our derivative p prime is gonna be equal to two minus 180,000 divided by y squared. And so now we can set this derivative equal to zero and solve for our value of y. And so if we do that, we'll have zero is equal to two minus 180,000 divided by y squared. And so if we add this term to both sides of our equation, then we'll have 180,000 divided by y squared is equal to two. And then we can multiply both sides by this y squared, and we'll have that 180,000 is equal to two y squared. And then we can divide both sides by two, and we'll have this, we'll have 90,000 is equal to y squared. And then we'll take the square root of both sides, and the square root of 90,000 is 300. So we're gonna have y is equal to plus or minus 300. But now remember what our domain is. Our domain says that it only makes sense for y to be a positive number. And so y is just going to be equal to 300. And so now since we know what y is equal to, we can now find what x is equal to by plugging this value back into our constraint. And so 180,000 divided by 300 is going to be equal to 600. So x equals 600 in this case, right? We just plug this 300 into that y. And so now we have our two values. We have y equals 300 and x equals 600. And so the dimensions of our pasture would be 300 by 600 meters. All right, and so that is the end of this optimization problem. And so now that you have seen two examples of optimization problems, I'm going to briefly put up the guidelines for solving an optimization problem that you're familiar with now, just in case you wanna review them before we move on to our next example. So feel free to pause the video and read over these. But once you're done, let's go into our next example here. All right, so for our final example, we have a rectangular box with a square bottom and open top is to be made using three square feet of cardboard. Find the dimensions of the box that maximizes the volume. And so let's label our diagram. Let's try to label each of our sides here because remember, we're gonna be trying to maximize the volume. And we know that volume is found by multiplying the width times the length times the height. And so in this case, I'm gonna label the edges of our bottom, which are going to be the same because it's a square bottom with X. So I'll have X and X. And then I'll label the height of our box with H. And so then in this case, the volume would be equal to x times x times h. And so in this case, our volume is equal to x squared times h. And so this is going to be our primary equation. This is going to be the equation that we take the derivative of in this scenario. But now notice that this is defined with two different variables. We have x and h. And so we're gonna to wanna to change that. We're going to want to define this with just one of those variables. So we're going to need to find a constraint equation. And if we go back to our problem, we see that this box is to be made using three square feet of cardboard. And so what that means is that this box right here was made with a piece of cardboard that has three square feet, meaning the area of that cardboard was three. And so you had to take that cardboard and fold it up into this box, right? And so really what's going on here is the surface area of our box here is going to be equal to the area of the cardboard. And so what we have here is that three is going to be equal to the surface area of this box. But what is the surface area in terms of x and h? Well, we have five different sides here, right? We have the bottom side, and then we have these four rectangle sides. 
So let's start by finding the area of our bottom side. So that's gonna be x times x. So that's gonna be the first part of our surface area formula. We'll have x squared, and then we're going to add the area of these four rectangles. And they're all going to be the same. They're all going to be x by h. And so we have four of those sides. And so we're gonna have four x times h. And so now we wanna take this equation and solve for one of our variables so that we can plug it into our primary equation. Because in this case, this is our fixed value, right? This three is not going to change, which makes this our constraint or secondary equation. And so in this case, I see we have multiple terms with x, but just one term with h. So I think it makes the most sense to solve for h in this case. And so if we subtract x squared from both sides, we'll have three minus x squared is equal to four x h. And then if we divide both sides by four x, we'll isolate this h and know what h is equal to. And so if we do that, we'll have that h is equal to three minus x squared divided by four x. And so now that we have what h is equal to, we can plug this into our primary equation. And so we'll have that the volume is equal to x squared times three minus x squared divided by four x. And so now before we move on into taking the derivative, we're gonna to wanna to simplify this. And so let's do that next here. We'll have that the volume is equal to three x squared minus x to the fourth divided by four times x, right? We just distributed this x squared each part of the numerator. And so now we can simplify this a little bit by noticing that there's an x in each one of our terms. And so we can factor out that x. And so that means that our volume will be equal to three x minus x to the third divided by four. And so then we can simplify this one more time. I'm gonna write that the volume is equal to three fourths x minus one fourth times x to the third, right? I just split up our fraction here. And so now before we take the derivative of our equation here, we need to ask ourselves what values of x make sense in this situation. Well, what is the smallest possible value for x in this case? Well, for one thing, we know that we can't make x a negative value, right? You can't have a side that is measured in a negative amount. So we know x is going to be positive. And so we can say that our domain is going to at least be a positive value. So our lower bound is zero. But what would be the largest value of x that you can have in this case? Well, remember, we only have three square feet of cardboard to work with here. And so if you were to make a box with the largest bottom possible, how large could you make it? Well, it would have to be in such a way that the area of that cardboard is still three, right? It can't exceed three. And so that means if you were to make the area of a square bottom equal to three, each of your sides would have to be equal to the square root of that area, right? So X would have to be the square root of three because the square root of three times itself would be three. And so if X was the square root of three, well, you just have a flat piece of cardboard. So that really wouldn't be a box. You wouldn't have any height but the moment you start to add a height, then your x has to get smaller, right? So that you can make that box because you only have so much cardboard to work with. And so because of that, your upper bound will be the square root of three. All right, so now that we have determined the domain, we can take the derivative of our function. And so if we do that, we'll have v prime is equal to three fourths. And then the derivative of negative one fourth x to the third power will be three times one fourth. So we'll have negative three fourths and then x squared if we subtract one from our exponent. And then we're gonna set this equal to zero and solve for x. So we'll have zero is equal to three fourths minus three fourths x squared. And then if we add this term to both sides, we'll have three fourths x squared is equal to three fourths. And so then since both sides are multiplied by three fourths, we can actually cancel that out. And so that means that we will have x squared equal to one, which tells us that x will equal plus or minus one. Now remember, we said that x has to be a positive value. And so in this case, let's just write that x equals one. And so now we just have to take this and plug it into what h is equal to to figure out what our height would be for our box. Because now we know that the bottom is going to be one foot by one foot, but we still need to know our height. And so if we plug one into this function here, and I'm gonna write that over here, we'll have that h is equal to three minus one squared divided by four times one. And so that's gonna be equal to three minus one. So that's two divided by four. And so two divided by four is one half. And so h is equal 
to one half. And so that means that the dimensions of our box are going to be one by one by one half. And that's all going to be in feet. And so this would be the final answer to our problem. We found the dimensions for our box that would give us the maximum volume. All right, so that's all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more examples, I'll have an examples video linked at the end of this video as well as in the description. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. But if you don't, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.